Turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, please, to the book of Romans, chapter 8. Mary and the girls back there could leave if they wanted because this is where they came in. Isn't that what we used to do in the movies? I mean, uh, when we rolled around to where we had seen it, we'd, we'd leave. But uh, listen, it could be a little bit different. Reading from Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of, of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. The word Christian doesn't really mean an awful lot in the world today. Because if the world looks at Christian people, they say, what's the use? We're doing the same thing. We're as good as they are. And multitudes of people claim to be Christians, and I mean, they could be perverse, they could be drunkards, they could be whatever, you know. But they claim to be a part of a church. Whether it be Baptist, Bible Church, Methodist, Catholic. Did you know that Hitler died as a member of the church? He was never excommunicated. Because the leaders thought that he would destroy the church if they kicked him out. Now, that's something to think about, isn't it? But... Sadder still, Christian people, people who can point to the day when they accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, and yet their lives are shabby, and we've not come up to what God has a standard for us. And today we want to look at the acid test. What is it? What is it? Well, God has a standard for his people, and that standard, of course, is Jesus Christ. And that's possible, made possible through the Holy Spirit, whom God has given us. Now we know there's only one way to become a Christian, and that's through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that. But now there's only one life. And the ninth verse, which will be our key verse, reads, but you're not in the flesh. In other words, you're not the old person you used to be because you've been born again. You're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And we believe that from the day of Pentecost on, every person who is born again receives the Holy Spirit at the moment of new birth. And God just moves into our lives. We may not realize this, and most of the time we may not have any idea that God is right there. But the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You see this church building built back in 1890 or whenever it was, 1892. This is not the church. Good grief, you are the church. I am the church, as that little chorus puts it. We are the dwelling place of the Most High. God dwells within us. Then somebody else wrote the song, my God is big, big enough to fill this whole universe, but small enough to live within my heart. But the, the amazing thing and the beautiful thing is, he lives in your heart, your heart, your heart, your heart, my heart. He can be everywhere because he is everywhere present. And what a, what a beautiful what a beautiful thing this is. Now, we are to walk in the Spirit. Verse 1, 
There is therefore now no condemnation or judgment to them which are in Christ Jesus. Jesus bore the judgment on the cross. And we don't have to. A person outside of Christ already is judged. In other words, condemned. One foot, one breath away from hell. But there's now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Because we walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We have a new drummer that, and a new drum beat that we walk to. But I go down to verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now as Christians, we're to walk a new life. We are to walk according to the scriptures and according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And those things that we find impossible to do, you know, attaining to the, the high watermark of Christianity, the Holy Spirit, if we'll just let him and we surrender to him, he takes over and produces the righteousness of Christ in us. And we are, each one of us, to be growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the acid test, I suppose, is Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And listen as I read the verses just before it talks about the, the works of the flesh, you know, and it's not a pretty picture. But beginning in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now this is not sensual love, this is God's love. This is love, love from above, helping us to love people that we could not, helping us to love God, yeah, I mean, that we could not otherwise. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Sometimes on Monday, do you feel like, no, you feel like that on Friday, I guess, but Monday is, is, is kind of a down day. You feel like blah, you know? Uh, we can have the joy of the Lord and we can have the peace of the Lord. Long-suffering, that's patience. Lord, give me patience, but hurry. But uh, it goes on to say, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And I go on reading. And they that are, in, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We are to have a new walk now because we're Christians. We are to walk the walk that Jesus gave us. Every one of us ought to be stronger in the Lord than we were a year ago. Every one of us ought to be growing every day. Mary and I visited a couple of our grandkids this last week. And we couldn't believe it. Good grief, these little babies now are 9 and 11, well, almost 9 and 11. And the 11 year old, I mean, I looked at him and he stood by his mother and he's as tall or taller than his mother. And I said, You know, you're going to be a man before your mother if you keep this up. And just a, a great little guy, you know. And we're to be growing too in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ every day. Now, Let's talk about the acid test of Christianity. What is it? Well, I go back in my Bible to the book of Mark, first of all. Mark chapter 12. And here's one of the marks that we've been talking about in midweek. And I begin reading in verse 29 of chapter 12 of Mark. And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. How many of us can measure up to that? And we cannot apart from the Spirit of God dwelling within us. Because we are self-centered. We're ego-centered. And that's not all bad. But, I mean, we get carried away with this. Everything has to revolve around me, you know. But now, we're to love God more than our family, more than our jobs, you say, that's not hard. Uh, more than anything, we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. And the only way this is possible is we die to self and live unto Jesus. The only way it's possible is the Holy Spirit working within us to reproduce this love for other people, but for God. But I go on reading in verse 31, or verse 30, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy, uh, down to 31. And the second is like, namely this, 
Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The man, when Jesus told him this, said, well, who's my neighbor? And he talked about the man that was left on the side of the road, beaten up and all, the good Samaritan that came along and helped. But our neighbor might be that family member. The neighbor might be someone within the church family. It might be somebody down the road. Basically, we're talking this morning about loving one another within the family of God. And John tells us in 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, but especially in 1 John, that we're to love God and love our neighbor. And if there is one person that, a, a believer, another person that we cannot love, that we hate, he said the love of God does not dwell in us. And we need to be very careful here and just put our life on the line because this is an acid test. We can't have a hate list as a Christian. We've got, to, we've got to love people. And we can't do this sometimes. But God can help us do this. Now we can be selective. Now I use that term very advisedly. There are some people that we might get closer to and we can bond with than other people who, you know, may be like a, a, a sharp prickly. And all right, we love them, but we don't. We may not be as close to them. But love is something that only God can give us. The Holy Spirit working within us. And this is something, folks, that we need to, we need to work on. But how is the love of God measured? Well, in many ways, devotion, dedication to Him, dedication to His Word. You know, you can't be a good Christian unless you're in this book. This book is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's given to you a love letter. And we're to read it. And prayer. Unless you're a person of prayer, you cannot possibly grow. You need to be praying constantly for yourself. You need to be praying about other things, but just to talk with God and to walk with God and the church. We've raised a generation now of people that don't know what it is to go to church. The Lord said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Because when you come, he said, I'll be there in your midst. I'll be with you. And folks, we need that. We need a time when we can come apart and just worship the Lord and fellowship with the Lord, and fellowship with other Christians, and recharge the battery. We're just about like some of these hybrid cars now. We can walk, or we can go for a while, but after a while, we've got to be recharged. I don't know what's going to happen when we get so many of those hybrid cars and we have to plug them in every night that's going to really tax the electrical systems I don't know how they're going to handle all that but as Christians we can plug into God and that's what we're supposed to do and that's what we're supposed to be doing all the time Jesus said also we're to love him love God more than we love anything or anybody else Well, then there's the spirit of forgiveness. Are you carrying around a weight in your head, in your mind, your heart of something that somebody did to you or said to you and you just can't stand? I, I'm amazed at families that are not on speaking terms with one another. Moms and, and kids that don't speak, that can't stand each other, can't stand to be around each other. When I was on the road, I would uh, often talk about my mother-in-law and tell what an awful person she was and tell jokes about her. And I was down in Indiana on meetings just not too far in Indiana, Denver, <coughs> Indiana. And I had been talking all week about my mother-in-law. And I said, now tomorrow night, I told him on Thursday night, tomorrow night my mother-in-law is going to be here. And she was. Mary was along and, and uh, they gave her a round of applause and a, and, and a dozen roses and all. <coughs> Well, is there somebody that you really can't stand? Watch it. A grudge or hatred's like acid. It'll eat your own heart. It'll eat your, it'll eat your entire, entire person apart, your, your soul. Yes, you'll be saved, but you'll go to heaven with that hatred and it's got to be taken care of there and you've got to go through a real bath and a real cleansing. 
and real scraping before you can really get, I used, you know, I told you, I think already about Jimmy Baker and Tammy, and Tammy died and she's in heaven now. She finally got in. It took them months and months to scrape all the, the uh, you know, <laughs> off of her face. But can you imagine the scraping that we're gonna have to go through? I mean, here we carry all of these things through life and instead of confessing them, do you know that every sin that you have ever committed, every sin that you are, that you're going to commit is under the blood? And if you're a Christian that has been forgiven, then you, why should we confess it, you might ask? Because when we confess it, we get back into fellowship with God. It's like if I blow up with Mary sometimes, and I do that too often, and uh, uh, flowers will just erase that. And you know how it is. Or can, I used to bring candy, but she said, don't bring me candy, bring me flowers. And so uh, that, or do something nice. And but. Folks, let it go. Let it go. Let the peace of God dwell in your hearts and minds. Let the love of God not only cleanse you, but all of your relationships. But the spirit of mission, too. We're not only to come into church and soak up a little bit for our own selves, but we're to take it with us. There's a world out there that's hurting. It's a world out there that many, many people have never believed on the Lord Jesus. And you know it's easy to believe, but you must believe. And we're to take the good news and spread it around. That's our job. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, we can't go to Africa, but to our money that we send and our prayers, we've got somebody stationed over in Africa. We can't go to Spain, but through our prayers. We go to Spain and through the money that we send. And around this area, oh, listen, there's nothing like a good gospel track left in the hands of someone that you may never have the opportunity to talk to. It could be a waitress in the restaurant. It could be anyone else that you see but to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is, this is tremendously important. But our prayers ought to be, Lord, use me. And do you know that every one of us has a body gift? And by that I mean to minister to the body. This is not a big church. But this is an important place of ministry for each of us. You may not be able to play the piano or the organ. You may not be able to lead the singing or teach the Sunday school class or be the treasure. But there are other things you can do. You can be an encourager. And to help the body of Christ as we come together and through the week, if one is sick, not only pray for them, but maybe take a meal in or minister in any way that you can. The Corinthians were enamored with the bigness and the importance of the, some of the gifts. And that's what they wanted. But God was saying, look, there are all kinds of gifts. Take the backside of the hill for me. And it doesn't matter if you're seen or not. I see it, and I record it. And if we're willing to do that, and just go up with a handshake and say, I'm praying for you when a person is going through deep waters, or taking a meal to someone who is sick, or whatever like this you may do, we each and every one have a body gift. And we can say, Lord, use me. Whatever it is, Maybe it's just a smile. Maybe it's a song. Maybe it's work around the church. Whatever it may be. Like the one little chorus, I'll do it all for Jesus. I'll do it all for Jesus. Whatever it may be. Who in the world would want to put themselves in Bob's and Julie's shoes? All the work that they put into drive-in church and the concerts and all. How many would want to take all of that on? I'll do it all for Jesus. I'll do it all for Jesus. How many of you would want to teach a Sunday school class? I'll do it all for Jesus. How many of you would want to play the piano or organ? We're glad some of you don't. But how would you, how, how would you like to do this and the practice that goes with it and all? I'll do it all for Jesus. And you're special. You have something that nobody else has invested for the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the Bible says, by their fruits ye shall know them. 
when God looks down from heaven, what does he see in our lives? Are we growing? Is he proud of us? Those little boys that we saw, I don't know, it's Thursday. We were over there for a couple hours in Fulton. I mean, if I wore suspenders, I would be like my dad used to be, you know, with his fingers underneath the suspenders, his chest going out. Is God proud of us? I'm proud of my wife. I'm proud of my kids. I'm proud of my grandkids. I'm proud of my great grandkids. We got a real, real batch. We're trying to repopulate the earth with hills. But is God, when he looks down, is he proud of us? Are we proud of one another? Does somebody look at us and say, now there's a real man, a real man of God. There's a woman, a real lady of God. And this is what we're to be growing into. Marilyn has a beauty shop. God has one too. And some of these ladies come in every, every Saturday morning. One lady comes in about 6.30 all the way from South Bend, I understand, just to get beautiful. It's almost like Mission Impossible, isn't it? But, but uh, we, have, we have a beauty shop too that we're to be in. That's God's beauty shop. And we're to be coming more and more beautiful. Even with all the wrinkles and, and the hitch in our get along, we're to be more beautiful. And even though some of you don't have hair anymore, God says you're beautiful. He has to look through our hair to get down to, to, to real, you know. But we're to be in God's beauty shop. What, what does God see? What do other people see? You minister to me. I called on the Coopers yesterday, and they were just so overcome. They lived way in the middle of nowhere, <coughs> the only house on that particular street, but they couldn't get over it. A preacher had never called on them before in their whole lives. And here they are in their 60s, late 60s. But they ministered to me. They were exuberant, they were, they were cheerful, they were happy. And you minister to me. I go into a nursing home, I go into a hospital. The big preacher had surgery. Brother William had surgery uh, Friday. And I was up there, you know, to have prayer with him beforehand. And he was surprised, I guess, that I was there. But he and his wife were so happy about it. They ministered to me. And I get into a nursing home and pray with someone. That, that revs me up. You know, we're a body. The same spirit that indwells you is, indwells me. The same spirit that indwells me indwells you. We're one. One in the Lord. Now what are we to be doing? We're to be growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. We're be, to be growing to be better people. More beautiful in the things of God. God help us because we sure need it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for what you have done and what you are doing and what you're going to do. We thank you, Father, for the promises that we have of heaven and someday going to be with you. But until that time, Father, we need you and we know it because we mess up so easily. We forget. We unplug ourselves. We wear out. And we need a fresh touch from off the altar right now, dear God, each of our hearts and each of our, our lives. If there's one person here who has a special need, they need to either accept you as personal Savior or to dedicate their lives or just to come forward for membership or rededication. Dear God, I pray that you will help us to do it in these closing moments as we sing this song of invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.